we now come to Revelation 19, verse 6 through 10. This portion of Holy Scripture relates a new vision received by John on Patmos. Immediately it is clear that everything here centers in the glorification of Christ's bride. For John hears a mighty thundering of voices, raising a song of praise. For the merits of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and shining, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And since this is the message of the song, the angel who speaks with John commands him to write a beatitude. Blessed are they, which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now it should be clear to us that this vision is the counterpart of that other vision found in Revelation 17. While Revelation 19 announces to us the glory of Christ's bride, the 17th chapter is replete with the judgments which in the last days shall come upon the harlot, who sat upon many waters. John first told us that the harlot is condemned, but now he proclaims that the bride is about to receive her glory and her lovely bridal gown. Thus the contrast between the two prophecies is complete. Yet it may not escape our attention that there is an intimate relation between these two chapters of Revelation. All too lightly we suppose that in this book we receive many distinct and isolated glimpses into the future, something like viewing a series of separate slides. This is incorrect. Throughout the book runs a straight line. All of us know the difference between a film and a slide projector. The man who makes use of the latter is constantly showing a new scene on the screen, a series of distinct pictures. But he who shows a film does something quite different. He presents a series of closely connected shots, so that we are aware of the progress from the one to the other. Whereas the slide projector can only give a series of pictures, each separated from the next by a leap as it were, the film presents a coherent picture. Here is a story in which the action is seen and the progression is exhibited. So it is in Revelation. John does not show a series of shots to portray the end time, but a drama of the consummation of all things. Here we see the total development from one stage to the next. He shows, as it were, a film of the last days. Consider for a moment. If Revelation 19 were an isolated scene without any connection with the rest, then to be sure it would be interesting to few. It would be a consolation when in all the struggles and stress of our day we would be given a glimpse of the coming great glory. But then we would be unable to see the progress. We would grasp nothing of the way which leads to that glory. We would be compelled in order to taste the comfort to take a leap in the spirit out of our present realities to the glory which will come, only immediately thereafter again to be plunged back into the misery of our grim and grey existence. But now keep clearly in mind that John is not showing an isolated slide in his projector. He is running a film. For who is the one speaking with him here? This is the same angel mentioned in chapter 17 one of the seven angels who empty out the files with God's last plagues upon the world. He led John in the spirit into the wilderness, far beyond the clamor of the world. Here John no longer received a message. He was hermetically sealed off from this life. But then God had this angel show him the film of history. John first beheld that breathtaking spectacle of the beast, with seven heads and ten horns, and of the adulterous woman who sat upon that beast. By this time you know about all this. The beast is the satanic world empire, the one realm of blasphemy and abominations, which since the days of the flood has manifested itself repeatedly in a different form. Almost without interruption the world empires follow each other. The old Babylonian, the Assyrian, the Neo-Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greco-Macedonian, the Roman, ever in another form and in new carp, but still always the incarnation of the demonic drive towards world unity 
and international fraternization apart from God's promises and contrary to his commandments. A world empire in a variety of forms and yet essentially the manifestation and realization of disbelief and disobedience, a realm ever and again of blasphemy, of apostasy, and thus always as a wild beast which wreaks devastation and misery. And then suddenly the deadly wound, for the sixth head is cleft and crushed and thereupon the world is broken up into nations and kingdoms. Then comes the modern period of history, with its many peoples and boundaries, which make it impossible again to unite mankind into one nation. It seems therefore that a satanic monster, after the dissolution of the Roman Empire, will never rise again, as if it has been wounded unto death. Yet after so many centuries it succeeds. Then men learn to rise above their divisions and their wars, and a satanic world empire rises anew. How clearly we learn to understand history here. For today we look into the jaws of that beast. We see the contours of the seventh head becoming clearer every day. To this is then added that other, that even greater terror. The woman who commits adultery and decks herself with the glory of this world. The apostate church, which breaks the covenant of the Lord and commits adultery and slays her faithful children. The harlot, who has become an international power and dictates throughout the whole world and thus determines the course of politics and commerce. Who flirts with the leaders of the world and allies herself with them who makes all men drunk with the glory of a Christian culture, the church which forgets her heavenly calling and despises her splendor from above and adorns herself instead with gold and purple and jewels, until at last the Lord produces the Antichrist and his ten vassals and drives the whole world to attack the apostate church. If your experience is as mine, you can no longer escape the oppressiveness of this vision. For the seventh head of the beast makes himself manifest. The world empire approaches so silently. It is already much nearer than we think. You must realize that already now boundaries are being effaced and our government finds itself powerless to do anything. You must see that our nation as well as the others is being controlled by Lake success. And surely you must be seeing the world church with her amorous eyes and filled with adultery. Now then, this life of ours as it takes shape in our time, this history which is unfolding itself, John saw with his own eyes on the film of the end of the world, which the angels showed. This was, so to speak, the initial act. But now comes the second act. When the apostate church has reached the zenith of her apostasy and adultery of her unfaithfulness to Christ and the true children of the church, in the days of the seventh head, when world empire and world church together push such fornication to its extreme and so create a glittering Christian culture which deceives nearly everyone, then suddenly the seventh head will make way for the eighth, the kingdom of the undisguised Antichrist and his ten vassals. They no longer join forces with the adultery and shocking splendor of the church, which while flirting with all around, builds a brilliant culture and becomes drunk with the blood of her own children. On the contrary, suddenly they loathe her. They are filled with revulsion at the sight of her and all the blinding luxuries in which she clothes herself. They must have none of her pious speeches and Christianized culture. Furiously and vehemently they fall upon the apostate church. All the rulers of the world crowd after the Antichrist, each one surrendering his crown and authority to the beast, to follow him blindly. More unanimous than ever before in the history of the world are they, for God has suddenly untied them after all their feuding and fighting. He has delivered all the potentates unto a universal and wholesale hatred against the harlot, and they plan to kill her. This then is the second act of the drama which John sees in chapter 18. 
he beholds the great Babel, the church solely united in unbelief and disobedience. He beholds that great Babel, consumed by flames. This is a conflagration in comparison with which the flames of Rotterdam were of no account. In a moment the whole Christian culture is destroyed. All its treasures, all the wealth and pomp and science and art, indeed all that the international church has built up by her apostasy, is consumed in an instant. In consternation John describes all this for us. The kings of the earth, the merchants and the multitudes in the streets. For commercial life in its totality was geared to the Christian culture of the apostate church. All waxed rich because of her, and in one hour all this glory is destroyed. Now you may ask whether there is no one who is grieved because all these cultural treasures are devoted to the flames. But they could not do otherwise. God had made all the leaders of the earth one in will, and has inclined their hearts to do His will. God will no longer tolerate that culture, and He presses all the powers to do His will. Therefore they set fire to do it, so that its smoke arises forever. All the splendor and glory, wherewith the apostate church bedecked herself, and of which she caused men to drink with delight, all this is destroyed in one hour. Of the apostate church and her culture nothing remains.